Awesome. Awesome. All right. It just feels quiet in here today. Do you guys think it feels quiet? It feels quiet, like something. So I don't know. Try to try to see if I can uh, liven it up a little bit here. Uh, you know, I I normally don't um, uh, preach with with notes. So like I actually I was I did notes this week. I'm, I mean I was all in uh, as as I'm trying to determine what direction God wants us to take. And so this 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 idea we're going to go through Luke a little bit as we look at this story of Jesus and and this this idea. That God prepared the way. He had a plan in place. I don't like this. Hold on. I put my power pack in the same back pocket as my wallet. And that just doesn't feel good. So I'm going to switch that. Sorry. TMI maybe. Uh, All right. Um, God prepared the way for Jesus with John the Baptist. So, spoiler alert, we're going to talk about John the Baptist and his, his story, uh, as he, how he entered the world and why and that kind of stuff and what that meant for his parents. Um, but, but God has been preparing the way for Jesus for a long time. He's been working this, this plan uh, to bring Jesus about all the way back from the Old Testament. That's part of what we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Um, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to start with a word of prayer, and I, I'm going to ask you to pray for me. i got to... I got a kid who didn't sleep last night at all, so I have a wife who didn't sleep at all last night, um, and that's all bad news for me. Uh, I've got a dog that's peeing everywhere, um, and so that's just a, a nightmare. Uh, so, so my life's pretty rough right now, so would you just pray for me uh, that I get out good message here today and that, that God would speak through this, because I really believe that this idea of God prepares what we need before we need it. It's, it's, it's established ahead of time that he has prepared this plan for exactly what we need before we need it. Um, and I believe that that is in this message here today, and I'm, and I, and I'm praying that, that somebody here today receives that and, and lets it change your life. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, would you be in this place today? Would you, as we have called on your name from, from our prayer time before Sunday school started, Lord God, uh, in our Sunday school classes, uh, what we've prayed already in this sermon, Lord, that you would be here that your Holy Spirit would be powerful and that, that somebody here today, whether it's myself alone or whether it's, it's all of us in here, Lord God, would hear from you today and would realize that the things that they're going through right now, the brokenness that is in all of our lives at times, is leading us to find Jesus Christ. And not just in a moment, not just at, at a one-stop place where we, we, we say, okay, God, I'm with you, now I'm going to go on with my life, but that our answer, the answer to everything is Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, help us to get that message today. We pray this in your wonderful and holy name. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 1 uh, is where we're going to be at, starting in verse 5. But, uh, you know, God's plans, and this is kind of, you know, I, I, took, I took notes this week because I, I was starting to, Usually what I do is I go through and I'll take my own notes, but I don't bring them out here because I like to just be able to, to talk um, and not follow notes. But I started to, to study some of this stuff about God's plans. You know, God has a plan for all this stuff. His plans are always on time. Even when we think they're, they're too slow, it's not moving fast enough, God, I'm ready for this to happen. And you're just, God, you're dilly-dallying around. Why are you doing that? Um, and sometimes we feel like um, we're not ready for the plan that God has for us. We feel like he's kind of pushing us along and, and we feel like we're going to be pushed off a cliff. Um, and so whether it's fast or slow, God's plans are always on time. And so I started, I was studying this idea of God's plans. I'm not going to share about what I studied there, but um, the idea of planning uh, was very prevalent in that. And so I was like, man, I better, I better plan well for this sermon. And so I've got my notes here. Um, and I think that, that, that God has got something for us today. Uh, he, wor- he works fast and he works slow, at least according to our perception of fast and slow, right? Uh, if we look through the stories of the Bible, um, the Israelites were in captivity. Anyone know how long the Israelites were in captivity? Anybody know? Guess? What's the guess? How long were the Israelites in captivity? 70 years? No. 400. Who said 400? Pastor's wife. Yeah. 
She didn't know that. I didn't tell her beforehand. All right. 400 years they were in captivity. Now, 70 years they were in Babylonian captivity for 70 years, but overall it was 400 years. That's a long time, right? You're the people of God, right? He, everyone knows the Israelites, you are God's chosen people. From Abraham on, you are chosen and they were in captivity for 400 years. That's insane, right? 400 years. That's generations. That's people living through, dying, and never being brought out of captivity, right? And so we, we sometimes we expect in our 60, 70, 80 years of life that God's going to do something amazing in our lives. He spent 400 years with these people. That's why it's so important that as we raise children, who raise children of their own, who raise children of their own, that we keep God the focus of our families because he does work generationally. 400 years. Now, inside of, because of that 400 years they got brought out of captivity, we have the story of Moses and the burning bush, right? That's, that's pretty awesome. Uh, if God had worked like that and not used Moses or done some other way, we wouldn't have that cool story of, of this burning bush that, that Moses got to talk to. Uh, we have the, the story of the, of the parting of the Red Sea, right? That's one of my favorite Old Testament stories, the Red Sea parts. Israelites walk through, the Egyptians follow behind, and the waves come down. All the Egyptians die. Hooray, right? Like we wouldn't have that awesome story if God had worked on our timing or on the Israelites' timing. When they had first cried out, God save us. God listened to the cries of the Israelites for 400 years before he worked it out that they would be saved. That's a long time. We read just last week about the woman who was subjected to bleeding for 12 years, right? She, she was doing everything she could. She went to doctor after doctor. 12 years that she had to deal with this problem before God, through Jesus Christ, healed her. Now, we also find times of him working quickly, where he's kind of pushing us along. And if you read the stories of when he uh, invites the apostles, um, the 12 disciples, to, to come alongside him and to go on this journey with him, he finds them doing their jobs, for the most part, fishermen, tax collectors, those kinds of things. And he says, drop what you're doing, follow me, right? How many of you would do that today, right? Trevor, you're, 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 you're at your computer in the hospital, right? And, and Jesus walks in, says, Trevor, you are going to follow me right now. Stop working for the hospital and let's go. Okay? Like, that's a little quick, right? You're like, I need to put in my two weeks. I need to, to make sure that, that this is covered. Let me, let me check my 401k, make sure I can draw out of that. Like, we don't have that opportunity sometimes when Jesus really pushes us. Okay? And we are a people that like to plan in general. Like, it's, we are so weird um, as human beings. We say we like to, to be in control and we want, we want to be comfortable. We want to plan things out and be confident of what we're going to do. And then we take that step and we walk in. We say we like to do that. At least maybe it's just me. We say we like to do that. And then, but we, in reality, uh, we don't plan very well at all. And we just go willy-nilly into whatever we want to do. And we end up making mistakes and all that kind of stuff. But... God will work fast, and he will work slow. And whether it's fast or slow, we must maintain our faith that he is working out his plan, and that God has a plan, and no matter how it's going, whether we are languishing in, 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 in sorrow and despair like the Israelites were, or we're just going about our lives, and God comes along and says, boop, here you go. Whatever it is, we've got to know that he has a plan. And even in that, even in our fear, even in our doubt, even in our um, unsurety, we are sure of him. Amen? Have you ever been there before? Unsure of yourself and the direction that you need to go or the step you need to take, but you're sure that he is behind you. I know what that feels like, and it's scary. But to have that faith in him is so important. Now, the prophecies of the Old Testament about the Messiah, if we, 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 you know, we're going to read uh, the, the, the verse in Jeremiah uh, 33, 14 through 16. I'm going to read that in just a, a few moments. Uh, if you go through the David, uh, the book of David and go through those prophecies, the Messiah is talked about over 700 years before the actual birth of Jesus Christ. That's a long time uh, for God to work out his plan, right? And if you actually go from uh, the end of 
um, the Old Testament to the start of the New Testament, there's another 400 years. They call it the 400 years of silence. There's nothing written, recorded during those 400 years of time. And they say God was silent during that time, but yet he's talked about the Messiah before that. And then, boom, we've got the gospel writings and Jesus' birth. And it all comes together over a long period of time. Before we get to Luke, I do want to read that verse in Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah 33. 14 through 16. And we're actually going to read this verse uh, every Sunday of Advent. This is a great, great prophecy. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, he was one who, he cried to the Lord for 70 years. He's one of those ones that kind of led uh, back from Babylon. And he was, he was weeping over the city of Jerusalem and the sin that the Israelites were in. And then he gets this, this promise of restoration, is what the, the heading of chapter 33 says. And in verse 14, uh, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do that. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. It's so good. There was a prophecy about Jesus hundreds of years before he was even born. And then we see it come to fruition. It's so awesome to be able to see how God works looking back. And we can have faith that right now he's doing the same thing. We just can't see it sometimes. And do we have the faith to walk into his plan because we've seen what he's done in the past. And we're comfortable moving forward because of that. So we, we, we come here, this, this Jesus thing is about to happen. Uh, John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus. Uh, he was born to Zechariah and Elizabeth. Uh, who, who, who were Zechariah was a priest in his town. Elizabeth uh, is from the line of Aaron, as we're going to see here when we read this, who was the original uh, Levitical priest. And so there, there's the priest marrying a, a, a priest's daughter or a descendant of a priest is big doings. These were important people uh, during this time. Uh, he was in the priestly division of Abijah. We're going to read that here in a second. And it's, it's so cool. Like this idea John the Baptist has been coming before Jesus his entire, even before he was born. We see it here three months before Jesus is born, John the Baptist is born. Uh, the, the priestly division of Abijah. So uh, all, there's 24 rotations of priests, right, of, of groups of priests. There's 24 divisions. Uh, Zechariah was in the, the, the division of Abijah. Um, and his turn to go to the temple and work in it, as we're going to read here in a second, he was the one rotation before the priestly division, uh, Yeshua, which is the Israel name for Jesus, right? That's the, the pronunciation of Jesus. And so it's just so cool that, that that's even, even that was um, predecessor of, of Jesus. Um, this is during the time of Herod the Great, we're going to realize. This is the Herod um, who had his own wife and three sons killed uh, because he was so scared that they were going to overtake his throne or they were going to work out some sort of uh, you know, uh, uh, tyranny against him and they'd, they'd take him out or they'd, they'd, they'd do away with him. So he had his own wife Three sons killed, brutally killed as well. He also, and the reason this is important, he corrupted the priesthood during this time. Uh, he was so scared of, of anything that he couldn't control that he actually had the, um, a lot of the priests um, assassinated and killed. And he filled those roles with priests that had been like in little towns along, along, all along the way. And so instead of, you know, I, I, I can't, I'm trying to think how, to, how to, to describe that in our time today, but he had some of the, the big boss priests killed to promote priests that he could control that came from these smaller towns. And so that's kind of important as we're looking at this because Zechariah, as a priest, is performing these duties for a king that was corrupting the whole system so that he could control it. And as we find out, Herod later wants to kill all the babies in Jerusalem, all that kind of stuff, to get rid of Jesus. And it's just nuts. And we're going to read now Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 17. That's up there. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, 
There was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Amen. A couple things to point out about this uh, particular passage. Uh, and it's kind of cool, if you, read, if you continue reading this story, Zechariah uh, decides to kind of argue with the angel of the Lord that was there. And the angel of the Lord says, you want to argue with me? Fine. You're not going to talk for the entire time your wife is pregnant. So he comes out of the temple as he's doing this, and he literally can't speak to the other people that are out there that were praying, the other priests, after he had gone in. He can't talk, can't talk the entire time of pregnancy. And then we find later in the chapter that when Elizabeth gives birth, uh, they ask her, because he still can't talk, what's the kid's name going to be? She says, John. All of them say, that's crazy. No one in your family is named John. And that's how they named people back then, if it was someone else in their family. And they all turn to uh, Zechariah and said, is that true? And he's nodding vigorously. Yes, we're going to name him John. And all of a sudden, his mouth is loosed and he can talk again. Uh, it's kind of a cool story. Um, don't argue. If you ever have an angel of the Lord appear to you, don't argue. Okay? Just, just don't do it. It's not, not, not a smart life plan there, okay? Um, so Zechariah and Elizabeth are going about their lives. Uh, there, there's this burden, right? They have, they have this, 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 this burden on their life. They don't have a child, okay? They're older in, in life. They don't have a child. Um, and this, this, this was a, a big deal. Elizabeth was barren. Uh, they were both very old. Uh, and that's just from the scripture there. And this is a big deal. The Jewish community... At this time, they, they were descendants, right, of, of Abraham um, living in this thing. And, and, and Abraham was given the decree um, to go and multiply, okay? He, that you will be the father of many nations. Your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the sea. So this was a big deal in the Jewish community. You were supposed to have kids and fulfill this Abraham covenant and go and multiply, um, and they had not been able to do this. There was no children uh, for, for them. During this time, it was thought also that barrenness uh, in a woman was, was similar to like a disease or a uh, deformity, some kind of, of, of sin in your life. If you remember, even when it gets to the, when Jesus is healing people and they have the, the, the man who's, who's blind um, and Jesus rubs mud on his eyes and he can see after that, after he washes in the, in the, in the river, and the disciples asked Jesus, well, who sinned that this man uh, was born blind? Was it his parents or was it him? Uh, and Jesus said, you know, and that's the idea at that time was that something like that was a result of sin in their life. So they're living with this burden like they don't have any kids. Uh, the custom at the time is to have as many kids as possible. Um, the idea that you can't have sin or you can't have children, there's probably sin in your life somewhere. Um, so they're dealing with that burden. They're dealing with all this kind of thing, um, and there's pressure on them. Um, there, there's, there's just weight pushing down. It's a burden that they can't get out from under. Everybody would have known about their troubles because of Zechariah's position in life. He was a priest in this town, and he had to, uh, twice a year, his, his uh, uh, group of priests, the Abijah priests, would go to the temple and they'd go in. And during this particular time, he was chosen by lots. It was, it was kind of a, uh, uh, how, they, how they decided things back then. Um, he was chosen to go in and, and, and perform the duties in the temple at this time. But he was of high position in that place. They would, all, everybody in the place would have known how much pressure was on them. And they would have been adding to that pressure. 
And, and, and the, the idea that we can take away from that is the burdens, are the burdens that you are, are, are feeling in this world today. And, I, and I'm not even going to guess. I think I know, I know some. Uh, you guys have shared some burdens uh, with me, and that's, that's normal and what should happen. And you share it with other people around you. We are to carry each other's burdens. But the burdens that you feel, the, the weight of the burdens in your life, do they overshadow the blessings that are in your life? What do you find yourself thinking about more? Do you find yourself concerned so much with the burden or burdens that you forget about the blessings? Or, or the blessings become annoyances sometimes? What are your burdens today? Some people have uh, money problems, health problems, problems in their home, there's relationship issues, there's sin that you can't seem to get away from. What is your burden today? And I, and I, I believe, because I, I have never had a time in my life when there was not a burden on my heart of some, some form or fashion, some kind or another. And so if I were to sit here and say that, that there's someone in here that doesn't have a burden at all, I don't think I would be correct. I think every single one of us in here has a burden to bear. And I'm asking you, what is yours today? And does it overshadow the blessings that God has put into your life? And if it is, then we need to figure out how do we get out from underneath that burden. And the great thing, just like today, can be for any one of us, that day was a burden-lifting day for Zechariah and Elizabeth. The longing would be satisfied. The emptiness that they would have felt because of this, this no child, um, there was an emptiness there they would have, they would, that would have been filled, that emptiness. There were things that happened on that day that are just like today for us. Just like today. Today's an ordinary day. Sunday, we show up at church, Right? Follows an ordinary yesterday. Saturday, we watched football, right? Some of us enjoyed that more than others. Uh, don't, don't laugh. Okay. Zechariah was called out to do his duties, and he did them, right? He goes to the temple, he does his duties. That's what he's supposed to do that day. They were following the customs that they were supposed to carry out. It's, no, it's, it's, it's good to note um, that in verse 6, it says, Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. They were just going about their life, living their life every single day, doing what God wanted them to do, fulfilling the duties as was the custom of the time. Prayer was happening during this time. It says there in verse uh, 10, When the time for the burning of the incense came, all of the assembled worshipers we're praying outside. So Zechariah is doing his duty. People are praying. Uh, it's a great thing, right? But it's just the normal thing that was going on during that time. Normal stuff. And yet it became an awesome day when God showed up. And the angel of the Lord spoke to Zechariah. I want you to know that that, that prayer part is pretty important. Uh, we, we try to gather uh, here on Sunday mornings uh, before Sunday school at 9 o'clock. Uh, lately, it's getting pushed to, to 9.15 and 9.20 and 9.25 and 9.30 because uh, it's tough to get, get here on time and do all that kind of stuff. But, but I want you to know that we pray every Sunday morning before Sunday school. Uh, we call on Jesus' name to come into this place and fill every single classroom. Uh, fill this room here. Because we want him to do the work. Us just showing up, that's, that's half the battle. That's part of it. But we need to call on his name. And say, Jesus, I can't do this without you. My burdens are not going to be lifted without you. Here are my burdens. Now we find out, it's interesting, that the angel came and said to Zechariah, your prayer has been answered, or your prayer has been heard. From on high, right? He told Zechariah, your prayers have been heard. Most people will think that that's, they're praying for a child, right? Uh, 
in all actuality, they were not still, probably not still praying for a child due to their advanced age. What they were praying for was the deliverance of their nation. If you look at uh, chapter 2, verse 25, I believe. So they take, uh, Jesus is presented uh, to, to this man in the temple courts, uh, Simeon. And he, he takes him in. In verse 25, he says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. So they, 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 Simeon was kind of uh, someone who had been praying for the deliverance of Israel. Remember when Jeremiah was prophesying, they had been just... It had been nuts. Nothing good was going right for Israel. They were in a whole bunch of sin. Have the 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then all of a sudden we have Jesus. And before Jesus is John the Baptist. And everybody has been praying for the deliverance of Israel. And it started. The plan started with John the Baptist. And this, this lifting of the burden for Zechariah and Elizabeth. And it was all part of God's plan to bring about Jesus. Many burdens have been lifted in the stories of the Bible. Many of them. Uh, just a few. Uh, uh, Bartimaeus, a blind man who is outside Jericho. Mark chapter 10, if you want to read about that. Uh, his burden was lifted in a moment, on a day when he was just living his life. Zacchaeus, up in a tree, right? A crooked man, uh, not a good guy. And boom, his burdens were lifted in one day meeting Jesus. The Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, right? Jesus should not have been talking to a Samaritan woman. She shows up at the well and Jesus meets her need, lifts her burden in that one moment on that one day when she was doing what she normally did. Ordinary day and Jesus showed up. Are you ready for Jesus to show up in your life? Today can be that day for you, just like it was for every single one of them. Is today your day to have your burden lifted? When burdens are lifted, this is the great part. Burdens are lifted and they give way to blessings. So many times we want to just have the release of the burden because we don't want to feel that, that weight anymore. We don't want the struggle anymore. We don't want the hard times anymore. But so many times God wants to do more than just lift our burdens. He wants to take those burdens away and fill those burdens with blessings. Amen? Anybody with me today? Like that's, I, I can't tell you how many times, I, 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 you know, I don't want to get... I'm not, I'm not going to cry. I'm not, I'm not going to cry. Uh, I, I literally thought, I can't tell you how many times I thought, I'm never going to get married. Okay? Uh, when I was mid-20s, uh, 24, 25, 26, 27, never going to get married. It's not, it's, it's not going to happen. Okay? It's fine. I could say that to people, uh, but I promise you, my mom, uh, <laughs> it was a burden uh, to her. Uh, that I didn't have, you know, that I, I was saying that publicly to her. I felt the weight of that, of, 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 of thing. And, and, you know, you look back now, you know, people say, that's not that old. You, you, you. I tell you this one, the worst feeling of my life during that time period. Uh, it was a Christmas morning. I don't know, I was mid 20s, something like that. Mom pulls out these, these photo albums. Uh, I'm sitting my grand. I think we were at my grandparents' house. Pulls out these photo albums, shows me a picture, and says, "I was 24 years old there. I got two babies on my hips. You know, what are you doing?" I was like 27 at that point, and so she's making fun of me because I, I have not yet gotten married and had any kids. Uh, and she wasn't trying to do that, but her her desires placed an extra burden on me. Right, so I'm feeling the weight of this burden. I want to get married, but you know, I just not they're not working. Nothing's working out. And then obviously I, I meet Rachel. It's lovely, awesome, favorite time of my life, uh, and and I love her to death, and I love God's plan. But that burden being lifted was so much more than just the removal of hard times. It was the filling in of blessings. Amen. Anyone? Anyone with me on that? 
Anyone understand what I'm saying? The burdens are lifted, and there's, there's, there's nothingness, right? We're, we'd, be, we'd be okay with that if you just take away this burden. But God says, no, I am, rem- I am the one removing the burden. When we let him remove the burden, he will fill it with blessings. And we see that in this story here. Uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth had hoped for a baby. Okay, they, they had hoped for it. They wanted to show love to, to, another, to, to, the, to a child, to a baby. You know, you see yourself in, in a baby. You get to live vicariously through them. You get to leave a legacy. You know, we talk about this generational thing. Raise kids that love Jesus, that raise kids that love Jesus, that raise kids that love Jesus. It's so awesome to have that idea. And that's what they had hoped for. They wanted this baby. Verse 57 and 58 in chapter 1. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy, right? She, she, was, she was happy about this baby. God gave them so much more than a baby. He gave them John the Baptist. He's still remembered today. DC Talk has a great uh, song about them. If you ever want to listen to Jesus Freak, John the Baptist is in there. It's awesome. And Zechariah and Elizabeth themselves are still remembered today because of the blessing that God gave them through the son that they hoped for. Through this burden that they carried for so long, they, 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 they needed that lifted and God lifted it, but he filled it with blessings. Many people came to hear John the Baptist preach over the course of his life. He baptized hundreds, if not thousands of people. In the name of Jesus Christ. He was the forerunner of Christ. He came to announce the coming of Jesus Christ. What an awesome blessing to be given. To have a burden lifted. And that to be what fills its place. That's amazing. And it can be the same for us today. So my question again. What is your burden today? What is weighing heavily on your heart today? Is it a family member? Is it a friend? Is it your own sin? Do you have problems at work? Struggling with money? Always sick? What's your burden? God wants to remove that burden And he wants to replace it with blessing. He wants to remove whatever it is that is causing you trouble and replace it with something that is going to fill you up to overflowing so that you can praise his holy name and the glory will be given to God. The last verse that we read in verse 17, the angel is speaking to Zechariah and he says, And he, your son, will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. God has a plan. He had a plan for John the Baptist. That plan came to fruition. He has a plan for your life. He has a plan for whatever it is that you feel the weight of right now. He has a plan to remove that, to fill it with blessing, so that you can give him the glory and praise his name wherever you go. He has a plan. Are you willing to do what he wants you to do, to walk in his ways, to live your life in a way where you are just following him? Zechariah and Elizabeth were seen as righteous in the eyes of the Lord because they obeyed the commands and followed the decrees that were set before them to do. Are you living your life that way? Are you living your life as a holy life? I read a great quote uh, as I was studying for this. The idea of a holy life, of being able to live a life pleasing and following God is, is, is difficult for a lot of people to understand because we, 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 want, we, we talk about grace and we talk about the fact that, that God's grace is big enough to cover up our mistakes. It's big enough to cover up you know, any of our sins so we can just go and, and live our lives and if we mess up, we ask for forgiveness and, and God's grace is big enough. And that's true. We also talk about wanting to live uprightly, to live righteously, right? And a lot of times that turns into legalism. That turns into just following the rules in order to follow the rules. And there's no joy. 
There's no, there's no happiness. We get almost, there's a burden to follow the rules. And so there's got to be this awesome mix of the two. There's got to be this, this thing that says, I am so blessed because of God's grace in my life that I desire to live by his standards. And that fills me with so much joy because of the grace that he gave me with Jesus Christ on the cross. Jesus Christ on the cross began with Jesus Christ in the manger and John the Baptist. The blessing to Zechariah and Elizabeth was the precursor to Jesus coming into this world. And John the Baptist just continued to set the table for Jesus, to draw people into uh, uh, an understanding that, that even though John the Baptist was, was doing what God wanted him to do, he was baptizing people in the name of Jesus Christ, he kept saying continually, there is one who is coming that is more powerful than I. He will baptize you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. What is your burden today? And Jesus is the answer, whatever it is. Jesus wants to heal the brokenness in the world. This idea of, of, of hope today, this first candle of the Advent season. Do you have hope? The burden that you're carrying, the weight that you feel of that, do you have a hope that it will come to an end? That that burden will turn to blessing? Jesus Christ can give you that hope today. Jesus Christ can remove that burden and give you a blessing. Whatever you need, Jesus is the answer. It may look different for each one of us. And sometimes that's hard to understand. Some of us get it, no problem. Some of us struggle with understanding God's plan for their lives. But in that struggle, turn to the answer in Jesus Christ. He is the hope of whatever it is that is weighing you down. Would you stand with me, please? I want to give you an opportunity to come to the altar uh, to kneel down and to give your burdens uh, to God, to Jesus Christ. Like I said, I don't believe there's a single person in here who doesn't have a burden of some kind weighing on them. Whatever your burden is, I would encourage you to give it to God. Don't hold on to it. I'm going to pray. Uh, Chris, if you would start some music when I, whenever, when I say amen, just nice and soft, doesn't matter what it is. And, and when I finish praying, if you need to leave, feel free to leave. Come and spend time at the altar if you need to. We'll pray with you, whatever, whatever you need. But make sure you leave here today knowing that you have turned over that burden to God and that you are going to wait patiently on the Lord as you live your life waiting for his blessings to fill that burden's hole. Give it to him today. Don't let another day go by that you struggle on your own. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you so much for this message that, that there is a plan in place, that there is always a plan when it comes to you. And that no matter what it is that we're going through, Lord God, you sent Jesus Christ to be the answer, to fill that hole, Lord God, in our lives. Heavenly Father, I know that there are, are people that are concerned for their family members, that for their salvation, uh, Lord God. And that's a burden that is weighing on people. I, I, I pray Lord God, that, that, that they would be able to give that over to you, that they would be able to say, God, I place my loved one in your hands. I lay my loved one here on this altar and say, they are yours, work in their lives. I know there are people that are concerned about their own health or the health of people that they love. And Lord God, I pray that they would be able to say right here at this altar, Lord God, I give you 
my body. Heal what you want to heal, Lord God. And Father, I know that there are people that are dealing with, 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 with issues uh, at work or with, at home, whatever they may be, Lord God, and I pray that they would have the courage and desire to give those burdens to you and to believe And that's even hard to, Lord God, but to begin to believe that you can replace those burdens with blessings. Heavenly Father, I've seen it done in my own life too many times to not believe. And I pray that those of us who can say that will testify to that over and over and over again so that those who do not yet know the blessings that you can give will believe that it's possible for them and they will have that hope of Jesus Christ. Well, God, I thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.